And we've been really uh, looking forward to this. So it's my uh, pleasure to, uh, to introduce our, our poet for tonight, uh, Henry Carlyle, uh, who was born in San Francisco and raised in the Pacific Northwest. He attended Grays Harbor College and the University of Washington, where he studied with Theodore Retke, Henry Reed, Elizabeth Bishop, and David Wagoner, and earned a BA and an MA with an emphasis in creative writing. His publications include four books of poetry, The Rough Hewn Table, 1971, Running Lights, 1981. There are two copies left of Running Lights uh, there. Uh, Rain in 1994, and the new book, Oregon, in 2013. His poems, essays, and short stories that have appeared in numerous magazines, uh, and he's, he's widely published. So uh, you can see a, a list of those in the, uh, in the invitation. His work has also been widely anthologized, uh, most recently in Bright Wings, edited by Billy Collins, and New Poets of the American West, edited by Lowell Jaeger. His grants and fellowships are extensive, and from 1967 until his retirement in 2003, I think I have that right, uh, he taught at Portland State University. He's also taught a writer's workshop uh, as a visiting lecturer in the Iowa Writer's Workshop in 1978-1980. Currently lives in Portland with his wife, Genevieve. Would you join me in welcoming our poet tonight, Henry Carlyle. Henry. So, water's here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, cool. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm hoping my voice will hold up tonight. I've been having some problems with it, but uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a few sections of the title poem of my newest book, Oregon. And I guess I better put on my reading glasses, <laughs> or I won't <laughs> read anything tonight. Oops, what happened there? <laughs> nice. All right. <laughs> Oregon. Weeks pass this time of year without a glimpse of sunlight, and a clammy, chilly dampness clings to everything. Wet, rotting leaves, fog in the trees through a dripping web of trunks and gray branches. On the riverbanks, the bleached, decaying carcasses of the last spawned out salmon Jaws sprung like broken traps, and everything colorless, featureless in the falling rain, but the moss in visionary shades of green, and the jade gray papery lichen, and on the topmost bare limb of the maple tree, my black iridescent friend, the crow, laughing. <laughs> Sometimes, I long for a different landscape, not the dry desert of the Southwest or the tropics, those blonde beaches rife with escaping flesh, but something plainer, flatter, clarified by the chill of midwinter, smoke from chimneys rising straight up into a blue sky, remote farms scattered among fallow fields, wind through wires, ice, ticking against glass, and everything sharpened to a promise flamboyant as a cock pheasant in snow. I know these are the tricks of elsewhere. Once there I would dream of bare, wet branches, plain dark bodies that one by one take the leaves places before they flutter off like leaves. 
Sometimes I dread the thought of dying here. In this place I have always dreamed of leaving until I realize that the place we dream of will always be another we carry with us, not the one we finally find ourselves in. Old age, as Larkin said, is having lighted rooms inside your head with people moving and conversing, ghosts, the friends who died or moved away, their letters fading, their faces forgotten, nothing left but words, so long, goodbye, take care, down corridors, in airports, depots, before the last door closes. The morning my wife left, I sat on the stairs and wept, scared by the hurt animal sound of it. I wanted to stop. There were shadows on the walls where paintings had hung, blank spaces on the shelves her books had stood on. No couch, no chairs, no table, no linen or bed. When Ray came, he said through a cloud of cigarette smoke, this place looks like a house in one of my stories. It feels like death. You've got to sell it. He knew he'd been there once. Three years later, he was dead and I'm still here. My boat docked on its trailer, my rods racked and still rigged with the last lures we used to fish the strait. Ray, this entire country begins to look like a house in one of your stories. In some trailer house of the spirit, at the dead end of hope, a cigarette burns down in an ashtray beside a half-empty glass of whiskey as the TV with its twisted foil-wrapped rabbit ear antenna shrieks. Monster trucks leaping the crushed chaos of Camaros and Impalas. I haven't the saint's generosity or Whitman's to call it beautiful. Only the fear, pure fear of death instructs me to call it better than nothing, to grind this butt in the ashes of grace. You're gone, and so is Stafford, who loved this place, a saintlier man than either of us, and Oregon persists in being Oregon, God's country, to those who have never lived here or any place but here. I haven't the arrogance to call this God's country. Last night an earthquake rattled the windows, the second this year, and the year barely begun. Maybe it will shake some sense into us. Maybe it will scare me into loving what I've taken for granted. <clears throat> Last fall, I watched a single pair of salmon hovering over a red on a tail out that once held hundreds. The male was hook-nosed and battered, charging an enterprising trout on the prowl for eggs. The female turned on her side, fanning away the silt from the stream bed with her frayed tail. All afternoon, I watched until their spawning began, the female thrashing as she cast her burden to the stream, the clean declivity where her eggs could swirl and rest. <clears throat> and the male's great shuddering spasm as he loosed his sperm and the white flood swirled over the red and clouded the current downstream. They would spend the short remainder of their lives guarding that spot. I felt the terrible privilege of my place at the river's edge, called to witness the end of something. I wanted to put back every fish I had ever caught I wanted to beg forgiveness of everyone I'd hurt, but the feeling passed. We learn remorse by the feeblest fits and starts. We learn to love when what we should have loved is lost. Well, that was a marathon. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I have some pretty long poems in this book, but I have some newer work that's shorter. <laughs> the longest poem is uh, actually um, 
my version of a, of a canto, I guess. Uh, it was inspired, of course, by Dante, and I'm not going to read from that, but... <laughs> it was... Um, um, it has the title, Debate a la Ruina, Before the Ruin, which is a phrase from the Infernal. And it was, uh, my mother is really the big presence in this book. It was written during a time when, um, well, it was written uh, not exactly during that time, but it's patterned on the time when we had the great flood here in 1996, and my mother was near the end of her life. She had, um, she had a terrible life. She ran away from home at the age of 12 to get away from my grandmother's religious fanaticism, and she went to work as a domestic. She was married four times, twice to alcoholics and abusive, one very abusive man. Um, <clears throat> and still, she, was, she managed to keep going. She did terrible jobs. She worked as a welder in a shipyard uh, in Richmond, in, during the war, and uh, she, uh, she was my hero and my nemesis. <laughs> she was a difficult woman. <laughs> but this, uh, this book is um, a rain, or not rain, Oregon has many poems uh, that have to do with her. She's a presence in it. I'm going to switch to something else right now. So. Um, <clears throat> I wrote this poem, this is uh, from the book Rain. Um, I wrote this poem uh, years ago uh, in a reaction to some of the survivalists. Um, the, um, uh, you, you may have seen the, the television series uh, <laughs> with the, um, a lot of these characters, doomsday preppers, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, this is a poem titled Camouflage. I came from a hunting family. Um, uh, my family hunted for food, and uh, uh, I w used to be a member of the NRA, actually, years and years ago, but it was a different organization then. I don't hunt anymore, I don't need to. But this might interest you. This is, a, this is a quotation from Carl T. Frederick, who is the National Rifle Association president in 1934. And he said, I do not believe in the general promiscuous toting of guns. I think it should be sharply restricted and only under licenses. Needless to say, the NRA has, has changed. I mean, it's been um, Wayne LaPierre, um, is currently a spokesperson for the NRA, is, is just a shill for the firearms industry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this poem, Camouflage, has an epigraph from one of W.S. Merwin's poems. On the door, it says what to do to survive. But we were not born to survive, only to live. So many piles <coughs> of leaves are walking about these days, disguised as humans. It must give pause. <laughs> Originally, we met only to fool ducks, dupe deer into posing like Saint Sebastian. But now, it looks like we are hiding from other heaps that mean harm, that mean to steal us from our families and lovers, or steal us against the unhappy prospect of quaking like so many aspens in the arms of winter. Or is it simply that we mean to advertise a sincere wish to become one with nature and quietly disappear, toting our taped and silenced M16s and Mini-14s and other ac automatic acronyms of extreme prejudice? 
There is big business in camouflage these days. We can be anything we want to be at last, a summer wood, an autumn wood, a big beige desert. We can even be dead grass, we can be snow. And let me not fail to mention our latest fashion, night. Night is very popular these days. What we do not want to be <coughs> is colorful. Color is suspect, a thing of the past, except for a week or maybe two weeks in spring, during the spring offensives, when even the desert forgets itself and laughs floridly. Then it is safe to be a field of poppies. <coughs> but we must never forget the latest heat-seeking technologies that have kept pace with our trade. Telescopes so powerful they are capable of detecting at incredible distances in the coldest environments the small trembling heart of a mouse. Oh, soldiers of fortune and misfortune, they mean to find us out, to discover in our iciest resolve a spot of warmth. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> I'm gonna jump around a bit here to something a little newer. Um, as you know, this is the um, anniversary of William Stafford's birth. I just, there have been a lot of celebrations. Um, and I was asked to participate in and one and wrote this poem for it. It's titled Far. It was his favorite word, and I think I know why. He grew up in a place uninterrupted by mountains, where every direction was far, and nothing much happened except an occasional tornado to screw a farm up into that Kansas sky. The level way of seeing he learned there became a habit he carried with him to this distant west. It perfectly suited him, up before dawn each day to write a scattershot pattern of poems. And if some missed, it didn't matter. The truest hit what they were aiming at and more. Once when I bitched about too many rejections, he grinned and said in his mild correcting way, one poem finds a book for every hundred I write. And not long after, as if to illustrate his point, he sent three poems I couldn't believe he'd written. He offered this cure for writer's block, his followers often quote. Lower your standards. <laughs> Good to see then when I read those poems, he was a man of his words, <laughs> undaunted. <laughs> no one thought better how fear of failure aborts success. Once when I asked him why a favorite poem I'd read in a magazine was missing from his book, he told me he always sent more than were needed and let his editor select what he liked best. In his modest way, Bill did think hard for us all. And we have reaped the fruit of his efforts. On this hundredth anniversary of his birth, we've gathered in many venues to honor him, to give thanks, to say, so long, Bill the way he always ended his letters. Okay, Bill also, as you know, wrote some great political poems. I wrote this one. It's sort of about trees, but it's not really about trees. It's called The Winter of Discontent for the Congress of these United States. Green, they rustled in new spring dresses. Now they twist and moan as though it were not the wind, but some other stress that bothers them. 
Do they sense down that long avenue of limb after limb where one of their kind has fallen that no disaster is natural? To see these branches as thousands of intentions, each mindless and innocent, and only a few rubbing themselves raw or sparring under the wind's provocation is finally to believe in repetition, no perfection without mistakes. And when branches get in one another's way, you could not call their adjustments political, but practical, a compromise, a mutual understanding to search for the right light in which to grow beyond themselves. Well, I'm going to um, jump ahead to a little shorter piece. This is a, my wife and I went to the beach. She's not here tonight, unfortunately. She's in Memphis. But she went to the beach, uh, we went to the beach together, and uh, she, uh, there were a lot of morning doves. And they were going off all day long, and it, <laughs> it, it bothered her. So I wrote this poem on the spot for her. It's titled, Doesn't Like Doves. <laughs> And it has an epigraph from a poem of Rutke's, a dove said dove all day. <laughs> it could have been her name if she were Sue or Cheyenne. My peace-loving wife doesn't like doves. Their day-long morning song drives her cuckoo. <laughs> She preferred the occasional crow's gargle or jay's screak to their incessant cooing. Sometimes she reminds me of my Swedish friend Maria, who when I told her I'd finally heard a nightingale, said, they keep me awake so much I throw rocks on the bushes to make them be quiet. <laughs> Why should that surprise me? My wife is part Swedish, though you'd never know it. Her name is French. I like hearing it so much. I say it over and over. <laughs> Genevieve, Genevieve. <laughs> so, <laughs> poor wife. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I went into an antique store once. And, um, I like to go in antique stores. I, didn't, I seldom buy an antique. I just like to go in there and look at things. But this one is titled, An Old Pump Organ. In the antique store where I found it, I peddled, but nothing came from the bellows save a stink. Then as I pressed the keys, a surprisingly melodious wheeze, as though the ghost of Johann Sebastian Bach had come to life, whispering, let go, let go, from the cracked and leaking innards. But I pedaled on, losing ground, as notes struggled to rise, only to die. And I swear, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something like a cockroach or a mouse scoot out the back. Perhaps it was a note. Uh, and disappear under the door. And I stopped. Nothing but the hiss of air escaping from the worn out bellows, as though box ghosts were falling back through the floor three centuries into the strata of polyphonic rest. <laughs> so goofy poem. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the, uh, the book, Oregon, um, uh, and read a poem titled, Dust. Where it cleared the roadway in a single bound, a rabbit in its jaws, my fishing partner stoned on grass watching the river for rising trout, said, dear, 
having barely glimpsed it. And I was fooled a second before I saw its spots, the spontaneous brevity of its tail as it cleared a ditch and disappeared among the boulders tumbled from a distant rim rock. Bobcat, I said. I had seen one in the wild once before, hunting with a friend, both of us bloodthirsty teenagers, eager to shoot whatever we could, both well practiced at picking bumblebees off flowers with our 22s. By the edge of a logging road, it stretched to sharpen claws against a stump, an easy shot, but we jammed our rifles in our haste, and in three puffs of dust, it was down the road and gone, an apparition of a cat, leaving only its tracks to prove we'd seen it, puffs the eddy as if we left them, as if it left them seconds ago, its bobcat shape shifting to a speckled streak. That's how you usually see them, in less than a heartbeat, a privilege that catches you totally by surprise, like a perfect rainbow rising after you've cast for hours without luck. Of course, you stand there with your jaw open and forget to set the hook. My wife frowns because wherever I have tried to dust, clean there is still dust on the furniture, and countertops, the telephone, stereo, and TV. Even the dog and cat are dusty as a dirt road. I could swear I'd brush them spotless. She has never hunted, yet tracks us by the spots we leave. Sometimes she misses the life she left where everything was clearer, or at least cleaner. Misses her parent, Shepherd, who snatches bees like pollen-speckled peppers from the lavender beside her parent's deck. Misses the view everywhere you turn of mountains. Here, the houses hem us in, and the dailiness of dust that settles in the wake of strokes that will never come clean enough till we are quit of this untidy world become the thing we spent a lifetime wiping out. How can I convince her that happiness is a bobcat and where the bobcat's been, the dust still hangs? <laughs> so, um, I'm going to read a couple of poems about airplanes. The first one, this is this was the first plane I ever flew on. You know the DC-3? Ancient. There's still a few of them around. So this is really mis mistitled. It's called the last DC-3. Well, it was the last one I flew on, the first and last. <laughs> Flying Hope Vent. Flying hope that night on my first leave, I remember how the long silver wings flex like a bird's in the moonlight as we bump through a patch of unstable air and the glow of the exhaust manifold in the starboard nassel was like a friendly stove, the deep vibration of the propellers and moonlit mountains below. Our destination, Moon Island Airport, in Hoquiam with its mill smoke and rain. And I wished a woman like Ingrid Bergman might rise from her seat and float through the rare air and ask me to light her cigarette. <laughs> but only the usual passengers were sleeping, talking, quietly reading, or smoking in the narrow fuselage with seats two abreast on either side and quaint curtains tied back from the windows. I was 19 years old on my first flight ever, fresh out of basic and safe from a war just ended. Experienced pilots affectionately call it a collection of parts flying in loose formation. <laughs> By then it was obsolete, but still holding on, 
17 hours coast to coast with three stops, a tail dragger pointing its nose skyward even at rest, as though it couldn't wait to get back into its element. Cold blue sky, cirrus clouds, barely reaching the jet stream before they called it that. But don't I know how silly it is to love a machine. <laughs> <coughs> well, um, I don't know if any of you saw the article in today's Oregonian about air rage. Did any read that? Yep. Yeah. And uh, it's about people getting angry on airplanes. It, and it's it's uh, understandable, isn't it, the way they pack us in and, uh, and somebody puts their seat back in your face. And <laughs> so I, um, uh, I have my own problem, which is even before you get on a plane. Um, <laughs> so I wrote this poem titled Profile. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before the TSA, I used to love flying. Love getting a window seat so I could look down on America and America could look up to me. Those crop circles that aren't really from UFOs those mountains and towns and cities and highways and lakes and rivers, those McDonald's arches. I loved passing the gates with my family and sitting together joking and laughing and hugging goodbye when it was time to show my ticket and head down the ramp. I even loved the peanuts and sodas and coffee and breakfast, lunches and dinners when everything was free. I loved taking off and landing and looked forward to the red beacons, white runways, and blue taxiways. I might have been a pilot if I hadn't worn glasses since I was seven. Twice, I even got to fly in a friend's Piper Cub. I looked down at our house and learned how to waggle the wings at my family below, they waving, me moving the stick right and left, my feet on the rudder pedals, it was like riding a horse of the air. But ever since the TSA, I can't tell you how many times I've been pulled out of line while my wife, who is tall and blonde, glides through the gates. <laughs> is it my complexion and hair or beard and frown lines that make me suspect? And when they tell me to lift my arms straight out so they can frisk me, I wish it could be by someone like Halle Berry or Angelina Jolie. Not some guy creepy as Christopher Walken with a crew cut. Or at least like the uniformed woman who when I asked about profiling pointed me toward the man waiting to pat me down and said in a voice like Lauren Bacall's, it's random, sir. <laughs> random profiling, I asked. She didn't think it was funny, and on second thought, I don't either. <laughs> I know that like me, they're only doing what they've been told. We are locked together in this script that bores us to death, that no one likes. But I wish I could give them something to make their day, something to tell their grandchildren when they are old like me, a stigmata maybe the blood leaking from my palms as I stand like a high-tension tower with my arms out in a strobing, subversive interrogation of red, white, and blue lights crackling from my eyes. If, if we could flap arms and fly like I dreamed I could as a child, we could be our own dreamliners. We wouldn't need airports, but a stigmata would be nice. So those agents and all the other passengers waiting before the gate would know how much I suffer for all of us. <laughs> so, well, so, all right. Um, this is a poem titled 
Beauty and the Bass. I loved a woman who played double bass. When she rolled her cumbersome instrument on its detachable wheels across the stage and carefully lifted it to the floor, you could hear a collective sigh escape the audience. She was that beautiful. Like a blonde Esperanza spalding without Spalding's torchy talent or electric cloud of hair, her choice being classical, her place in the orchestra not even principal, though she was principal to me. Her bass was larger than she was, like a fat Italian mama, with a sound so deep you could feel it inside you, a cave of music, a place of huge, intimate thunders. And yet its voice was soft as an old god's, who does not have to shout. The electric bass is fine, I guess, but I love the double bass. Jazz or classical, bluegrass or rock, ensemble or single, bowed or plucked. How it resonates both within and outside you. I love it walking like a man down a rainy, lamp-lit avenue in the dead of night, keeping the beat, the piano noodling around, and the brushes whispering over the snare or the way Willie Dixon plays it in bassology. But who can hear Miles Moody's bass rendition of Jimi Hendrix's Voodoo Child and not get goosebumps? After Beethoven first heard Dragonetti, he wrote scores for bass so difficult only Dragonetti could play them. And when the woman I loved practiced double bass, her strong but slender fingers on the bow teased it to life so that we swayed together like grass in wind. It was like love, and I wanted more of it. A great bassist once told me, the lowest string takes 25 feet to resolve. I still don't know what he meant by that, but if that was the string she used to reel me in, it snapped one year at the end of summer. And all through that fall and winter, wherever I walked, practicing ways not to miss her, I felt something resonating inside me, like seventh chord progressions in a minor key. Wherever she is now, I hope she still plays. And, um, Let's see how we're doing for time. I'm going to read you one more poem, I think. And, um, before my voice gives out here. Nature. My wife can't stand those programs where something is killing something else, and who can blame her? It's nature, I tell her, as if that made a difference. The death of the least furred thing brings her to tears, as if she were responsible and might prevent it. The cheetah streaks after a Thompson's gazelle, trips it and seizes it by the throat. A mother wildebeest tries in vain to save its calf from a pack of hyenas. And Genevieve turns her head from this carnage, angry because I go on watching night after night. The Serengeti, Sarajevo, trying to sort out the difference between the lion that kills a cheetah's cubs and leaves them to rot, and a sniper's estimate of the distance between himself and a mother out gathering wood. I know I should try harder to shield my wife from what she cannot bear, and yet some streak of yellow-eyed watchfulness instructs me to wait and do nothing like the scientist who will not interfere because nature, as he perceives it, 
condemns the weak to inherit nothing. Once a harder-minded woman scoffed when I broke up a fight between two stupid mallards bent on murder, or so it seemed to me, the air full of down. It must have looked silly, a man in up to his knees shouting at ducks. So I didn't blame her for laughing. But let me always write the beetle struggling on its back, stand between the dog and cat and the cat and sparrow, foolish and impractical as she accused me of being. And let me remember also why I married Genevieve, because she is kind and will not accept what others take for granted, that nature is otherwise and man no better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. What, am I supposed to answer questions, well, Tom? Yeah. 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 I know you studied with Theodore Rector. Um, who would you say influenced you the most as far as a poet? That's hard to say. Uh, you know, I've been accused of being influenced by Rutke, by, by uh, well, I know of one poem that I wrote, certainly uh, uh, that was in, uh, uh, influenced by Henry Reed. Do all of you know who Henry Reed was? I know. I know you do, Jim, but uh, he, he wrote a famous uh, poem called Naming of Parts that Dylan Thomas made popular. And then he, 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 um, he did the best parody I've ever heard. One of, it's what, one of my two favorite parodies. Uh, 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 what, he wrote Chard Whitlow. Mr. T.S. Eliot, Sunday Morning Breakfast, and Dylan Thomas read that, of course, on one of his rec it's on one of his records. It, it begins, you know, I have to be like, like, like um, Eliot. As we grow older, we do not get any younger. Seasons return, and today I'm 55, and this time last year I was 54. And I cannot say, <laughs> Should care, <laughs> and this time next year I shall be 62, <laughs> and I cannot say I should care to see my time over again, if you can call it time, <laughs> fidgeting uneasily under the drafty stare, counting sleepless nights in the crowded tube. There are certain precautions, though none of them very reliable against the blast from bombs, the flying splinter, vento di vente, the wind within a wind unable to speak for wind, and the frigid burnings of purgatory will not be touched by any emollient. I can go on, I can go on and on, but I won't, you know. Already submerged my own work, didn't I? <laughs> Well, that's one of them. The other one, of course, is Raymond Carver's parody of uh, uh, Charles Bukowski. Oh. You know that one? No. That's, a, that's a wonderful parody. Okay. I, I told Ray once, I said, that is a great parody. That's what, that is one of my favorite parodies. And he said, Henry, he said, it isn't a parody. He really said that stuff. I just <laughs> wrote it down. <laughs> 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 okay, well, uh, I, I think all of my teachers influenced me, certainly, and, and other, others that I've read uh, uh, influenced me. Uh, a critic who wrote uh, about me uh, <laughs> said that I was influenced, uh, my later work has been influenced by Philip Larkin, and boy, <laughs> I hope that's true, but I don't. I don't think so, uh, really. I love Larkin's work. Um, that's a hard one. Influence. I mean, obviously, I'm influenced. Who isn't? I mean, they're, they're, you don't learn to write without being influenced, do you? 
that's the best way to learn to write. Go ahead and let yourself be influenced, you know. And, and that's the way, paradoxically, you find your own voice. Uh, imitation, you know, it's the best way to learn. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. No one? <laughs> what was Rucky like? Ah. <laughs> uh, Oh, I could tell you many stories yeah, about Rocky. Oh, he was what he—he he was a wonderful reader of uh, of poetry, and uh, he had a his classroom was in Parrington Hall at the U Dub, and uh, there was a, a interestingly enough a greenhouse right outside the window, and and the professor who who ran the greenhouse actually looked a little tiny bit like Rutke's father, I heard. I don't know if that was uh, true or not. But Rutke had built-in bookshelves in his classroom. And he, uh, he, uh, uh, he would pull a book out of there and, and read from it. And I think... Uh, well, I, I started, I had always written poetry uh, from the time I was in high school, but the stuff I wrote in high school, <laughs> you wouldn't want to read. It was a, uh, they were naughty ballads. And, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> one time, one time uh, uh, a bunch of us were out drinking uh, Saturday night, high school boys, and sitting out on the beach approach getting loaded on beer. And uh, and one of the one of the kids recited this poem. He said, "Hey, I heard this poem. It's, it's a pornographic ballad." And he he recited, and I said, "Well, you got it all wrong in the third stanza. There it goes like this." He said, "Well, how do you know?" And I said, "Cause I wrote it. <laughs> you did not." <laughs> so, but so I had always written poetry, but. Um, I remember a specific day in Rutke's class when I knew I wanted to write poetry. I, I, I mean, seriously, write poetry. And it was his reading of Wilfred Owen's Strange Meeting, oh, yeah. the last poem that Owen wrote before he was killed. It, it was so beautiful. He got to the last part of that. I'm getting goosebumps telling this. He got to that last part that goes, I knew you, I, I, I knew you in this dark, my friend. I am the enemy you killed yesterday. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. Let us sleep now. And as Rutke got to the last part of that, his voice broke and he started to cry in front of the class. And I was so moved by that, I went home and I memorized that poem. Memorized the whole thing. And, boy, I... Rutke was... I remember his wife Beatrice getting mad at, at the whole class because we took him out on his birthday and got him drunk. You know, he <laughs> that shouldn't have done that. but. He was uh, he was a wonderful influence, but I think I was lucky to get away from Rutke's influence when I did, because the next person I studied with was Henry Reed, and Reed was what a wonderful teacher, but he was also the saddest, the most morose person I've ever known. I mean, he was just something. I, I found out years later, reading his biography, what it probably was that you know his, his, he, he had he had had a lover, Michael Ramsbotham, and I think, and they and their relationship ended badly. But he, I, I remember having to take him to the pharmacy one time to get a prescription meds for his depression, and he, uh, my next teacher, of course was Elizabeth Bishop. And Bishop and Henry Reed hit it off well, but they, they kind of made enemies of just about everybody else up there. Because uh, they, they 
hung out together. I was in the first class that Elizabeth taught. And uh, ironically, when I think it was James Atlas wrote her obituary for the, for the uh, New York Times, and he got it all wrong because he said that her f first class was at Harvard. She taught twice at the University of Washington uh, on, on two different occasions, two different appointments before she ever went to Harvard. But she was a wonderful teacher and she didn't like Rutke's influence. She felt that he was too flamboyant, too, too you know, spiritually exaggerated and that. I, I didn't agree with her entirely, but I could, I, I, I wish I could write like either of them. Uh, because they were they were both wonderful, wonderful in different ways. I mean, I remember uh, when Rucky uh, Rucky had won the Pulitzer Prize in poetry, and I said something to him about it, and he said, "Well, at least I beat out Lowell." <laughs> 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 so, so, but uh, I uh, he uh, he. Uh, liked to drink, he would drink sometimes at the Blue Moon, but there was another bar called the Rainbow on, on 45th Avenue. It's right on the corner. It's just uh, toward the university from the Blue Moon. And Rucky would, uh, uh, there was a bartender named Johnny Misens owned that bar. And he and Rucky really hit it off. And I remember going there one time with Rucky after class and Johnny Misen had had uh, a friend, I guess, who was a brazier salesman, and this guy, this guy, this guy had given him a whole sheet of falsies, you know, before they cut them out. <laughs> and Johnny Meisens was standing on the bar with this thing like a cape on his back, <laughs> jigging around, and like, <laughs> said something he didn't want to see. <laughs> <laughs> Rucky was was laughing, and they. Uh, um, I I was taking classic guitar lessons at the um, about that same time, and I remember coming from my lesson one day, and and I saw Rutke standing in the middle of the street, like this. Come on, Henry, come on. <laughs> so <laughs> go get a beer. But uh, he. Uh, um, he told me that he had been to the doctor and the doctor told him that he had six months to live if he didn't stop drinking. Well, he didn't stop and he died, as I think you probably know, in, in a swimming pool. Yeah, yeah. But he was a, he was a wonderful teacher. He, he got away with... <laughs> Stuff. I won't tell you this story, but it, it involved one of his women's students. She was okay, but she made the mistake. He, 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 nothing came of it. He made a pass at her, I guess. I'll tell you that much. And anyway, he, uh, she went home and told her mother. And her, her mother, uh, he was, uh, her father was a big person on campus. He was, he was a professor who had stood up during the, uh, against McCarthy during the McCarthy investigations. And he was very protective of his, of his daughter. And the daughter went home and told the mother. The mother and daughter both thought it was funny. They didn't take it seriously. But the father went right to Char Charles Odegaard, who was then president of the university. And... Uh, <laughs> I I heard about it because the the girl in question told me about it and she was laughing. She thought it was funny, but she said Dad really got mad and he went to see Odegaard. So I thought about I thought I better tell Rutke and I I told him and he said Oh, they won't do anything to me. They're not going to lose their Pulitzer Prize winning poem. It was a different time. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, nowadays he would have been out of there, but you know those are. But he was a, he was a, 
despite any faults he had, and all the po poets of that generation certainly did. I mean, you, uh, Wallace Stevens said some terrible racist things, and and uh, and most of them were anti-Semitic. You know, Yates, Pound, Eliot. You know, and, yeah, lot, lots. Of, it was a, it was a different time, certainly. But um, David Wagoner was uh, was my thesis advisor at Washington, and he was he he stood up for me when I got into it with some of the professors there, and um, and they were laying for me, and they they threw a trick question at me on my <laughs> MA exam, but I managed to feel that okay and get through. I wasn't the best student by by any means. I actually flunked English in high school. <laughs> so this is my revenge. <laughs> any anything else? Uh, well thanks a lot everybody. Thank you.